boy never forgets his first trip to the barber shop. In my case, I was 10 years old. It was my first trip because before then, in true Polynesian fashion, my father used to always cut my four brothers and I out here in our backyard at home using a Samoan print of fabric as a cape, which in my culture we call it ear lover lover. But on this particular day, my dad's scissors were blunt, and he also needed a haircut. So off to the barber shop we went. I remember feeling nervous and excited. Excited because this was my opportunity to have a different hairstyle other than a bowl cut. <laughs> <laughs> nervous because when we got there, the whole shop was packed full of men. And so we waited patiently for our turn. When it came to me, I remember walking up to that chair, all confident, jumping on it, all excited, to then hear my father say to the barber, uh, short back and sides, mate. Hmm. But when my dad finally walked away, I asked the barber the question that I'd been dying to know. Um, can you make me look like the rock and give me his sideburns? <laughs> I remember the barber cracking up just like that, and he said, I got you. <laughs> and so I watched him carefully, and honestly, within minutes, he completely turned me into the rock. <laughs> I thought I was the coolest kid in the whole world, so cool I couldn't keep my eyes off the mirror. To then feel my dad's big Samoan hand on the back of my head <laughs> telling me to stop checking myself out. <laughs> but the overriding feeling I had as I walked away from that barber shop was something that I had never experienced before. And that was the feeling of being important. I felt important. I felt seen. So it's no surprise that 23 years later, I have now been a barber, a hair artist, an educator in the hair industry for over a decade now. My first attempt at creating some hair art was shaving out a portrait of my favorite rapper, Tupac, on one of my flatmates. Now, I took my time on this because, you know, Tupac gone wrong could have easily ended up looking like Shrek. <laughs> but thank God I didn't because when I uploaded it onto Facebook, thank you. When I uploaded it onto Facebook, the official Tupac page shared my work, and within a day, it had received more than one million likes and shares. I know, I thought I was the man. <laughs> but <laughs> my victories haven't always been sweet, as my teenage daughter loves to remind me. When she was seven years old, she had the shave part on the side of her head. She proudly asked me, her father, for a portrait of her favorite singer, Beyonce. Put a ring on it. So, you know, confident as I was, I attempted to share Beyonce in my daughter's head. But in this case, Beyonce ended up looking like Jesus. <laughs> and, and no, I do not have a slideshow for that one. <laughs> but man, the tears came in. You know, I tried my best to save my butt by telling her, you know, darling, everyone loves Jesus. Jesus changed, <laughs> Jesus changed the world. <laughs> To then hear my daughter sobbing, saying, no, daddy, Jesus lives in my heart, not in my head. <laughs> Ultimate fail. So I started my barbering career in a little place called Aranui, in my backyard, in a little garden tin shed. I'm a second generation New Zealand-born Samoan boy who grew up in a three-bedroom state house with parents who immigrated from Samoa to New Zealand for a better life, but earned minimum wage most of their lives. I grew up with four brothers and four sisters. I am number six. And if I could summarize in one word what my childhood felt like growing up, I would use the word unsafe. Unsafe. When you think of Christmas, you may think of the times when, you know, the family all gets together, everyone's exchanging gifts, heaps of laughter, heaps of joy, heaps of food. My first memory of Christmas, I was three years old. I remember my father picking up the Christmas tree and beating my mother up with it. I'll never forget that night. My mom lying on the floor with my two older brothers on top of her, trying to protect her from our father. It was my first memory of Christmas but it was also my first memory of the way domestic violence fell and how it so brutally impacted my family. By the age of 10, we had lived in every woman's refuge home in my hometown. 
Sadly for us, this just became a normal and accepted part of our world. We didn't know any different. When the infamous movie Once Were Warriors came out, my siblings and I, we sat down and watched that movie and we laughed through the entire film. We thought it was a comedy because Beth Hickey's hidings from Jake the Muss was nothing compared to what my mother received. My mum's black eyes were way bigger. And I feel sad that no one in our world stepped in because my mum will go to church like that. Pregnant, bruised face, yet no one said or did anything. I was always wondering how not to make my father angry. I was always wondering what would trigger him next. And when I think back, I know things were so jacked up when the physical beatings were much preferable to the emotional beatings we would take. Imagine, imagine feeling so unsafe, not only to do the wrong thing, but to be the wrong person. My fears were unsafe this year. My opinion was unsafe this year. My thoughts were unsafe this year. Being me, Matt Brown, was unsafe. And because it was unsafe to be me, I grew up my whole life wearing masks. Wearing these masks, thinking that these masks would protect me. Whatever you wanted me to be, I would be. It wasn't until I met my wife, who's seen past all this, and seen the hurt man inside, seen the hurt little boy inside. Only then could I really be seen, because she still chose to love me. Only then did that feeling of that 10-year-old boy who sat in that barber chair many years ago come back to me. Because of my history, when I started my barber shop, my barber shed, <laughs> I wanted it to be more than just a place of giving good haircuts. I wanted it to be a place where people could be seen. I wanted to connect on a deeper level with the men in my neighborhood that I'd grown up with because I knew firsthand the power of what a haircut could make you feel inside. And I thought, man, if I can combine a great haircut with a good listening ear, then maybe something special would happen. You know, so many of the boys, so many of the guys in my neighborhood had gone down the paths of joining gangs, becoming incarcerated, addicted to sex and drugs. You know, the list goes on. Sadly, some even committed suicide. And I knew why too. The sad truth is that so many of us were just so traumatized from the childhoods that we had experienced that we were out here coping however we could. Their stories were my stories, and my stories were theirs. It was our pain that made us family. And in a weird way, we would laugh together in my tin shed barbershop about how many hidings we got as kids, how many hidings we got as kids, or how many times our mothers would gamble away the food money every payday, or how many times our dads had been in prison, or how much booze he could drink. It wasn't really funny, but somehow these conversations kept us from not feeling alone in our pain. Shared pain somehow feels less traumatic. I could call them my first clients, but they became so much more. Yes, they were my guinea pigs. <laughs> A lot of guinea pigs. <laughs> but they became my friends, my brothers, my teachers, but mostly just an insight into humanity. So I then started to spend my days and most nights talking to men of all ages and walks of life because funnily enough, the barbershop, the place where I'm looking at the back of people's heads, is actually the place where the men coming to me say they feel the most seen. You know, those early conversations were special. They were really special. But I'll never forget the very first time when I thought, man, this is it. My job in my barbershed could actually make a difference. It was late one night and I was completing my final haircut on a young man named Liam. Now, I remember Liam coming in, you know, a bit nervous, a bit scared. I mean, I would be too walking into someone's backyard, in the hood, <laughs> into the shed for a haircut. <laughs> but me and Liam, we connected on a deep level, especially over our fathers loving the alcohol. And as I always did, after the completion of a haircut, I showed my client Liam his hair in the mirror with another smaller mirror behind him using the reflection. And I remember Liam looking up and staring into that mirror for the longest time. And 
then he just started to cry. He just started crying. And I asked him what was going on. And he said that he had planned for this haircut to be his last haircut. As in this, this haircut was the haircut for his funeral after he would take his own life. And my heart just dropped. And I just grabbed them, hugged them, and cried with them. Thankfully, after our talk, Liam decided not to go ahead with it. But I remember him walking out of my shed, turning around and saying to me in the most vulnerable voice, thank you so much, bro, for seeing me tonight. And in my heart, In my heart, I knew he wasn't talking about fitting him in for a haircut. This was when I knew that my job as a barber in my garden shed was more than just a place where people could come and get a good haircut. It was a place where people could come and start to heal. And unfortunately, we as men, men, we have a lot of healing to do. Here in New Zealand, we have some of the worst statistics relating to violence against women and children at the hands of men. Last year alone, there were well over 120,000 family violence investigations by New Zealand police. That's one in every four minutes that's being reported that we know of. So as long as I've been talking to you guys, at least three people, three people are getting abused right now in our backyard by someone that they know. How much more family violence is happening out there that's not being reported? I know my mother, she never reported a majority of her beatings. She took so many for so long in the hope that he would change. So in my time of barbering, I've since seen all kinds of men wearing these masks and hiding. It is from this place of always hiding that I've discovered my real job is to actually help men take their mask off one cut at a time. To hold space for a man who can let his guard down and just share who he really is just for a second. You know, I've sat with some of the most staunchest, most ruthless, most successful, violent men in this city, in my chair, crying together. You know, let me just put this out there, people. This isn't a very popular business plan or anything. You know, step one, get a barbershop. Step two, cry off your clients. <laughs> but I don't care about digital marketing strategies or having 20 barbershops or having the best reputation in the game. I just care about making my chair a sacred space. It is my cathedral. Irrespective of culture and age, not many people are allowed in another man's space quite like this, so it's an honor that I'm never taken lightly. In my chair, my clients and I, you know, we laugh together, we debate, we disagree, they're usually wrong. <laughs> yeah, we talk about our kids, we complain about our wives. Um, I love you, darling. <laughs> but mostly I just listen. I really listen to these men who know they can share whatever they want. No judgment. I have learned that everyone Everyone wants to be seen, accepted, and loved. But we're all wearing these masks that we're too scared to take off, which makes it near impossible for anyone to know us, let alone love us. You are only loved as much as you are known. But will we have the courage to be known? I have calculated now that I've been... I've been talking to men for over 25,000 hours, which is some pretty hefty research in anyone's books. I'm pretty sure I should have a PhD in this by now. <laughs> but in all my years of barbering and talking to men hour after hour, I've come to realize a few things, and these things I know for sure. One, many of us don't know what real love is. Heaps of us think abuse is love because it's all we know, because unfortunately, it's all we've ever seen. Two, we're too scared to be vulnerable or even attempt to take our masks off because when we have done so in the past, we've been really hurt 
by the people we expected to love us. Three, we don't know how to trust people. So we either give people trust in all areas too quickly or we don't trust them at all. Neither option give us what we really want. Four, we don't know how to communicate our needs with those we're in a relationship with. (laughs) And then we get angry when they don't get us or give us what we really want. Five, we, we constantly interact with those closest to us from a place of our unhealed trauma. Six, we build walls instead of practicing boundaries. And seven, we have no idea of how to even begin to heal our own pain, but yet we somehow expect someone else can. Like, she has become our rehab, someone to inflict the pain we feel inside onto. So brothers, my men, if you can relate to any of this, trust me, you are not alone. A majority of men I've met are wearing their socially and acceptable masks of pride and anger. But underneath it all, we're all just hurt little boys who have been cut as children and are now standing here as adults bleeding to death over women and children who never cut them. There are men like this all over the world. Sadly, we have prisons full of them. We have men in bloodstained suits and high-powered corporate positions and even wearing uniforms. We have black brothers, we have white brothers, and we have brown brothers. I have learned in my job as a barber that color does not discriminate against family violence and childhood trauma, nor does wealth. For there are men hiding everywhere. And in my opinion, there are very few safe spaces left for us men. Very few safe spaces where Normal, everyday men don't have to wear a mask anymore. At work, you want to look competent, put on your mask. At home, we want to be the providers, put on your mask. With your friends, with your boys, well, you know, that's where we drink, talk about sport, and mock our way to respect. When us men face any kind of loss, disappointment, grief, Regret, shame, embarrassment. If we haven't learned how to take our mask off and be real, be human, be broken, then all we have left is anger. We need to find a better way. We need to be able to see each other so we can begin to heal. And stop treating our woman like rehabilitation centers. She is not your rehab. Your childhood trauma wasn't your fault. It wasn't your fault. But your healing, your healing now is your responsibility. At the opening of my, our first barber shop, I cut my dad's hair as the first man to officially be cut in my shop. And I also publicly forgave him. Why? Because today, I choose to see my father through the eyes of love. Today, I see the man behind the masks of the hidings and the drinking. I see a man who lost his mother at a young age and who had not adequately learned how to express his emotions. A man who was so shut down that rage and anger seemed to be the only acceptable outlet for how he felt inside. I see a man who moved countries with very little to better his situation so that we, his children, could have a better life. And how he must have found it so difficult to communicate in a whole new culture. And when I see that man, for him to do what he did to us, 
I mean, he must have been in such deep pain himself. And when I think of that man, he is no longer my childhood monster, but a scared man who also needs love and connection, like we all do, to heal and grow. Loving him and forgiving him doesn't condone his actions, but it releases me. It releases me to be the father. It releases me to be the father for my children that I've always wanted for myself. Men, it is totally possible for you to be everything that you've never received. The barber shop helped me see that man and to also become this man because there are people like him every day who sit in my chair. And for them, just for like my dad and I, behind the hurt, behind the pride, behind the gang pictures, behind the violence, is just somebody who wants to be seen and someone who longs to heal. I'll leave you all with one of my favorite quotes from one of my heroes, Dr. Brene Brown. <laughs> Same last name? No. <laughs> Courage starts with showing up and letting ourselves be seen. Thank you all for letting me be seen here today. And may you all each have the courage to heal.